Good morning, everybody. Pastor Allen here. Very special word of welcome to uh, everyone at each of our campuses. Uh, special welcome to everybody that's uh, part of the Vacation Bible School this week over at Union Cross. Uh, we're so glad to have you guys with us, everybody at the Clemens campus, the Ascent, and everybody else that's joining us by video. Are you ready for some good news? Get wisdom, and many other good things will likely follow. Wisdom's the treasure, but when you get the treasure of wisdom, usually there are many other treasures that follow along. I want to point you this morning to a beautiful passage in Proverbs chapter 3 as we continue in our series on Proverbs we call Foolproof. And today we're in Proverbs chapter 3, at verse 13, uh, the words of what was called the wisest man who ever lived, Solomon. Proverbs 3, verse 13. Blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding. For the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She is more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her are called blessed. And I want to just read one verse from Proverbs 17, verse 1. Many Proverbs like this one, but this typifies it. Better is a dry morsel with quiet than a house full of feasting with strife. I'm probably one of those guys that a uh, typical guy doesn't spend that much time thinking about what I'm going to wear. In fact, I'd say most of my adult life, I've been one of those guys that uh, spends three minutes or less. I mean, generally, what goes through my mind when I'm thinking about what to wear uh, especially for preaching, is, did I wear this last time? <laughs> and secondly, uh, does this fit? And uh, those are pretty much my uh, criteria of what I pull out of there. And uh, sometimes the selection isn't that broad between those two things anyway. But uh, some people in my life, uh, close to me, close maybe even within my own household, have encouraged me to think a little bit more about how I look because, after all, people have to look at me when I, when I preach. And so I've tried to give it a little bit more thought. And this week I had to give it even more thought because as much as I disdain it, it was time for me to get some new photographs taken of me. I, so I did a photo shoot on Friday night with a professional photographer and I had to think about what I was going to wear. Now, as I was doing this, I asked my daughter, Abigail, about some things I should wear because she understands trendy things. And she, she and I were talking about this. And I said, Abby, I said, do I tuck in my shirt or do I not? And she said, uh, you know, Dad, tucked is back in. Well, I was glad to hear this because I actually prefer the tuck shirt. But in recent years, wanting to be somewhat relevant, I often would leave the shirt untucked and I was driving to the photo shoot and I thought I need some confirmation on whether tucked is acceptable now and so I called an expert in our church who stays abreast of GQ and all of this uh, be one of the least likely people you would think would know about men's fashion but but he does I uh, wouldn't want to give his his name well his initials are, are Gene Francis and I called <laughs> I called Gene and I said, is it true that tucked is back in? And he said, Pastor, he said, tucked is back in for certain outfits. If you're in that sharp business casual outfit, you can go ahead and tuck. And I said, you sure I can tuck? He said, go ahead and tuck. And he said, in fact, I'm glad you asked the question because he said, honestly, Pastor, there have been some times that I've seen you on video and you were untucked, and I really think you should have been tucked, so you go ahead and tuck. Anyway, <laughs> anyway <laughs> wasting way too much time on tuck, non-tuck, is that I went to my photo shoot. And so I'm thinking a little bit now about, you know, how do I look? 
And one of the places we shot was I put on a suit. I, I had a pretty sharp bluish gray suit, crisp white shirt, no tie. And I uh, tucked. And I, <laughs> I'm down on the street in Winston-Salem for a kind of an urban shot, you know, leaning against a, a light post there, a light pole that has some character to it. And, and the photographer's taking all these shots. And a guy comes walking by and he says, you looking sharp. And he said, are you a model? And I just laughed. I said, no, I'm not a model. And he said, well, you could be. And I'm thinking, well, you know, I'm feeling pretty good now. about. It. I've been thinking a little bit more about how I look and it's paying off. And uh, then I was feeling good until all of a sudden that same guy says, uh, say, could you help out a homeless guy? And I realized he was just trying to bum a little money off of me. He's buttering me up. So there's no chance that I'm going to change over to becoming a model. Um, it would be so backwards for me and for anybody to say the primary thing is to think about my appearance when what really matters is the character inside of a person and all the callings on their life and so forth. But it's not wrong, on the other hand, to say that you give some thought to this. It's about what the real treasure actually is. And if I were to go over here and get obsessed thinking about what I look like at all, I just thought it would be a model, it would be destruction uh, in my life and my family would quickly go into poverty. Um, what we're talking about today is what you want most. And what you want most determines so much about how you live your life and what you end up actually getting. And so in Proverbs 3, Solomon is saying to us that there are some wonderful things that you might want in life, riches and honor and long life and pleasantness and just blessedness in general. But what he's saying is that while these things might be well and good, they are the lesser treasures. And what he invites us into is pursuing the greater treasure of wisdom. There is so many diverse ways that people preach the gospel. And some preach a gospel that seems like they're saying that just be a Christian and you'll have riches and you won't ever have any problems and other people seem to be preaching the gospel in a way that's saying, be a Christian, and the more you suffer, the more noble you are. And if you take a vow of poverty, that'd be even more noble. And it's just like, it seems like these extremes. And I want to show you today, I think, a biblical path about what's good about the idea of prosperity, but what is, at its essence, the heart of the gospel and what God's calling us towards as we look at Solomon and his words of wisdom for us in Proverbs chapter 3. Now, as a beginning point of this, I think it makes sense to look at Solomon's life itself because Solomon was deemed to be one of the wisest men who ever lived. But here's how it came to pass. Uh, Solomon, according to 1 Kings chapter 3 had a great love for the Lord. I'm at verse 3. Solomon loved the Lord. Walking in the statutes of David, his father, only he sacrificed and made offerings at the high places, meaning they didn't have the temple, and sometimes Solomon made sacrifices at high places where they had other places of worship. And he's not really criticized about that here, but it's a distinction at verse 4, the king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place. And Solomon used to offer a thousand burnt offerings on that altar. Probably a thousand is not literal. It's a figurative word. In, in Hebrew, a thousand means a lot. Offering generously these offerings, worshiping. And so at verse 5, at Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon in a dream by night. And God said, ask what I shall give you. And Solomon said, you've shown great and steadfast love to your servant David, my father, because he walked before you in faithfulness and righteousness and in uprightness of heart toward you. And you've kept for him this great and steadfast love and have given him a son to sit on his throne this day. So Solomon's father was King David. 
And David had been given this precious promise from God that his throne, that his family would always be on the throne. Verse 7, and now, O Lord my God, you've made your servant king in place of my David, of David my father, although I am but a little child. He's being figurative here because he's, he's a grown man as he's saying this. And I do not know how to go out or come in, which is an idiom, a figure of speech that means I don't know how to lead. I don't know how to do my job. And your servant, verse 8, is in the midst of your people whom you've chosen, a great people, too many to be numbered or counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding mind. And literally what he's asking for is wisdom. The, the literal phrase here for understanding mind is a listening heart to govern your people that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to govern this, your great people? At verse 10, it pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this. And God said to him, because you've asked this and have not asked for yourself long life or riches or the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern what is right. Behold, I now do according to your word. Behold, I give you a wise and discerning mind so that none like you has been before you and none like you shall arise after you. I give you also what you have not asked both riches and honor, so that no other king shall compare with you all your days. And if you'll walk in my ways, keeping my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. So there God has said, I'm going to give you wisdom, and then following that riches and honor and long life, which is what we just read about in Proverbs 3, right? And then verse 15, and Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream, then he came to Jerusalem and he stood before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord and he offered up burnt offerings and peace offerings and made a feast for all of his servants. So Solomon loved the Lord and he worshiped the Lord with great passion, demonstrated for these great sacrifices. He understood that all of these good things that had come in his life and that the throne that he was taking was a gift that had come to him by God's grace and we see God come and approach Solomon with a profound question. What do you want? So it's about God coming to Solomon, not Solomon coming to God. And what can God do for Solomon, not what can Solomon do for God? And this is very important to understand about the essence of the gospel itself. The gospel is such good news because when we didn't even know how to go to God, God came to us. And the gospel is not so much about what you do for God as it is what God has done for you. And Solomon's response was just so beautiful, wasn't it? He says, literally, I want a listening heart, a shema heart. The word to hear or listen, shema, in Hebrew can also mean to obey. They're almost the same thing. To listen, to really hear something is to obey it. If you don't obey it, then you didn't really listen. And he's so childlike in his humility, isn't it? He, is, he, he knows that all of this blessing has come not by his own doing. God's kept his promise, his chesed, his steadfast love. And you get this picture from God here that gives you the feeling that there's no limit to what God would do for Solomon because Solomon was so humble, that there's no limit to what God would teach someone who is teachable. There's no limit to how much God might exalt someone who is truly humble. And you'll see that Solomon here doesn't want the wisdom for wisdom's sake. But why did he say he wanted it? He wanted it so that he could govern wisely. I don't know how to come and go. I don't know how to lead. I don't know what to do. And, and so he's utterly teachable and childlike before the Lord. And, and, and the Lord is just so blessed by this. And he speaks, Solomon does, of the people in such blessed ways. He calls them your people, your people, Lord, whom you've chosen. A great people, too many to be counted. A great people, he repeats it, verse 9. So he, he doesn't want wisdom so that people will come and say, oh, you're wise. Although that's what's going to happen. He doesn't want wisdom so that he can become rich and prosperous and, and, and famous, though that happens. He wants the wisdom so that he can be a blessing. So here's this childlike king who loves God, worships God, and is asked by God, what do you want? 
and, and, and his answer is so pleasing to the Lord that the Lord says, I'm going to add to this the things you didn't ask for. Long life and riches and, and honor to you. And the Lord gave it to him. And in response to all of this, Solomon awakened from this vision, this dream, and he went at verse 15, and he went and stood, the text says, in the presence of the Lord. And this is a striking passage because usually it was reserved for the high priest to stand in the presence of the ark of the Lord. But Solomon comes into the presence of God and worships and offers him. So it begins with his worship at this text. It ends with his worship. And in the midst of it, this question to him. And this man, Solomon, is the one who wrote Proverbs 3 that we're in today. So Solomon's counsel to us in Proverbs 3 is not theoretical. It is something he's lived out. It's something that he has experienced. So from Solomon's story, at least this much is clear. And I think this is really important if you want to understand what is the Bible saying about this whole matter of, of prosperity and, the, and, and, and um, God's good blessings coming in our life and all of that, that, things that are desirable things. And the first thing that's important to understand that we learn from Solomon's story and that we see in today's text as I've said many times before, biblically speaking, desire is a good thing, to want something. There's a lot in this text today. We're back into Proverbs 3, and there's a lot here. Verse 13, listen to the language, who finds wisdom. Verse 14, the gain, talking about appropriating something. Verse 15, nothing you can desire. We're talking about desire, a wanting Verse 18, to lay hold of. Verse 18, to hold her fast. So wisdom is here personified for the sake of, of giving a picture. Wisdom is like a woman who is lovely and to be wanted. And it almost has the sense of romantic uh, attraction in this image. And if you hold fast to her. Well, this is all imagery of desire of wanting something. God isn't against desire. He created it. See, God himself has a will. And to have a will means to want something. And, it, and, and the stronger your will about something, the more you want it. And God has a strong will and a strong desire. And he made you in his image. And part of what it means to be in the image of God is you also have a will. And it's good to have a will. It's good to have deep desire. It's a, it's a sign of something that's healthy. It's not bad. It's good if you want things. It's important that a baby wants milk. If a baby doesn't want milk, then the baby's sick. It's important to want things. If you've ever been even mildly depressed, you know that your will begins to diminish. Your capacity to want things, your longings diminish. And if you get deeply depressed, you can lose interest not only in the hard things in life, but even in the easy, good things. You can lose interest in, in something as simple as a good meal or spending times with friends. People, they get depressed, they lose their will, and ultimately some lose their will to live. So having a will, having a want, a desire within you is a good thing. It's a mark of health. And when you've been part of a family or a system in which you've been taught, either explicitly or implicitly, that you just exist to please others, you can become confused and think that what you want doesn't matter. But what we learn from Solomon's story is that what you want matters to God. And it's interesting if God comes to Solomon and asks him a question because God is omniscient and he already knows everything that Solomon would say. So he's helping Solomon get in touch with what he wants. What do you want? What you want is going to determine so much of your life. It's also clear from Solomon's story in trying to understand the biblical framework around the idea of prosperity is that these things, riches and honor and long life and paths of pleasantness and shalom and all of these good things, 
that they are good things. God considers them good things. Uh, The fact that God gives them freely of his own initiative and grace proves that they're good gifts because God doesn't give bad gifts. They're good gifts. And God only has good to give and that's what he gives. So the story of Solomon is not one in which God is come to Solomon and Solomon says, well, I want wisdom. And this is not a picture of God going, whew, boy, I was afraid you were going to ask for riches and long life and, and, and honor because I, those things are despicable. And I'm so glad you didn't ask for those things. But no, he's just saying, I'm so pleased you chose the greater treasure. But he doesn't say these other things aren't to be considered as, as good. Let's just put this plainly too because there's a lot of confusion about it. But money is good. Money's, money's good. There I said it in a, in a sermon. It's a, <laughs> I would love how I stumbled onto Reader's Digest entries of people that sent in their funny things about money. Here's a few of them just for fun. I had my credit card stolen the other day, one man wrote, but I didn't bother to report it because the thief spends less than my wife. <laughs> That's cool. Um, I like one person wrote and said, I'm currently boycotting any company that sells items I can't afford. Yes, that's it. I'm going to boycott that if I can't afford it. Um, I like this one. Somebody wrote and said, I won $3 million in the lottery this weekend, so I've decided to donate a quarter of it to charity. Now I have $2,999,999.75. <laughs> Get it a quarter, get it donated. Quarter money, money isn't everything. One person wrote in, but it certainly keeps you in touch with your children. Uh, anyway, they could go on, but money is is something that is a touchy subject. But money's not bad. It's probably the most misquoted verse of the Bible when people say money is the root of all evil. Well, that's not all. First Timothy 6.10 says, for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. The love of money, of wanting the treasure of money disproportionately, of loving it, of thinking it's more than what it is. It is through this, Paul said to Timothy, this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. Reformed theologian, Uh, Wayne Grudem put it plainly, money is fundamentally good because it is a human invention that sets us apart from the animal kingdom and enables us to subdue the earth by producing from the earth goods and services that bring benefit to others. Well, Well, well put. He goes on to say, without money, we would have a barter system. And so money is just a tool that we use so that we don't have to have a barter system. And I'm glad we don't have a, a barter system because I wouldn't have much to barter. I mean, I imagine me going to the car dealership and I find the car that I like and I say, okay, I'd like to get this one. And uh, the guy says, well, what have you got? And I said, well, I've got sermons and books and pastoral care. What would you like? And, and, uh, and I just said, well, I, I said, I said, how many sermons will it cost me to get this car? What if the guy said, I don't, I don't like your sermons. They're too long. I, I said, well, how short do you want them? I, I, <laughs> or, or if he didn't like them, I said, well, I've got some books. I could give you copies of books. How many books that I've written would it take to get the car? And I wonder if he said, I don't, I, don't, I don't like your books. I like Tim Keller better. He's more compelling and clear. And I say, well, I've got inspirational writings. He said, no, I like Max Lucado better. He's more inspirational. I've got some pastoral care I could offer you. And, and he says, no, I've got... I've got no worries. A marriage is good, and I've got no real wounds I'm dealing with, so I wouldn't, have, I wouldn't be able to get a car. So money is just you know, like that. I was thinking about Pastor Chris. What would he have to barter? You know, he gets sermons and books and, and uh, history teachings and snarky comments. How many snarky comments would it take to buy this car? You see, no, money is just a tool that we use to transfer goods and services. That's what money is. And so as such, money is a good thing. Uh, It's not a bad thing. But the love of money, an idolatrous interest in money as if it can do for you more than what it can do, that is the root of all kinds of 
destructive thoughts and evil has been true. So God is utterly for your prosperity in the best and deepest sense of that word. Webster defines prosperity to prosper as to succeed in an enterprise or activity. Um, to be strong and flourishing is another definition. And if that's what prosperity means, then I want you to understand God's all for it. But uh, if what you think by prosperity is it means that you'll have no problems, then that's not what the Bible is teaching either. But you must understand the whole narrative of the Scripture is teaching about a God who's utterly for you. And the Bible's not at all embarrassed to speak about wonderful provision from God. I mean, he put Adam and Eve in paradise, in a garden. He said, eat of the fruit of any tree in this garden. It was absolutely beautiful. It was absolutely wonderful and sweet, delectable fruit and a beautiful paradise. Uh, and and he, he just said, don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the midst of it. God was a God of expansive provision and um, prosperity for them. When the people, in the, in the huge narrative of the Exodus, which is so important to the Old Testament and to the New Testament understanding of what God's done for us, is that he brought the people out of slavery in Egypt. But he didn't just say, okay, now you're free, and I want you to go in and live in a land and nearly starve to death all the time and suffer. And it's not what he said. He said, I want to give you a land flowing with milk and honey. He even told them to plunder the Egyptians as they came out because he wanted them to have their wealth. He wanted to provide for them. So God's not against these things. Look back at Proverbs 3, verse 16. Here are the things that are so delightful that come along with wisdom, Solomon is saying. Verse 16, long life, riches, honor. Verse 17, uh, ways of pleasantness. It means delightfulness, beauty, favor. Verse 17, peace, that's shalom, wholeness, and well-being. Verse 18, wisdom is a tree of life. What a beautiful, beautiful image because there was a tree of life in the Garden of Eden. And the people, Adam and Eve, were welcome to eat of the tree of life until they sinned. And God banished them lest they come back and eat of the tree of eternity in a state of condemnation in which they'd be eternally condemned. But this tree of life is a is what comes with wisdom, and you're invited into it if you have wisdom. And the life of blessedness, verse 18, you see, all of this is clear from the Scripture that God is, is for you. But what's equally clear in the Scripture, beloved, is that this doesn't mean that Christians are immune from suffering, and that this doesn't mean that there's some kind of guarantee of wealth. Not at all. Um, Jesus said, in this world you'll have trouble. Paul and most of the faithful disciples, they suffered, and they suffered greatly. Um, Paul even would speak openly about his sufferings. He was criticized. How could you be a super apostle if you've been suffering so much? Jesus even said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for righteousness' sake. And Jesus himself warned about the love of money, explained about the difficulties that can come to those that are rich, and he continually talked about our care for the poor and demonstrated a life of, of giving. So we have both these things. Let me see if we can just articulate a few clear principles that we're taking from Solomon's, both his life and what he's saying in Proverbs 3 and what we see throughout the scriptures. And the first is this. God loves to share his wisdom. And that wisdom is ultimately perfectly expressed in Christ. Christ is the perfection of wisdom in the flesh. And so knowing that God loves to give wisdom, when you want wisdom, when you want Christ, you can know for sure that you are wanting what God wants for you. See, here, here's where abundant life comes. God has a will, and you have a will. And when your will starts being the same as God's will, when you want 
what God wants, you're now connecting to what God really wants to give you, and therein comes the abundant life. So first, God loves to share wisdom, hunger for it. Secondly, I think we can clearly see this, that prosperity, and by this we include perhaps financial, economic success, or um, physical prosperity, or emotional well-being, relational well-being, shalom, all of this might be in it. This type of thing may very well be a byproduct of wisdom, but it's a byproduct. And by saying it's a byproduct, we mean it's something that follows after the priority of the wisdom itself. Right? I, you look at people in their life and you say, well, wow, God's really prospered what they've done. And oftentimes you'd see that what they really had was wisdom in their life. I, I was with a man this week, I would say as a very wise man, somebody I really like, a good friend and in our community that many, many people in our community know, but many people all around the world know because he's actually become quite uh, famous one of the best-selling Christian authors of all time. His name's Gary Chapman, uh, and he's, um, he is a genuinely wise person, I think. And so he's got a book, Five Love Languages, has sold uh, over 11 million copies. He's, he travels all, he's, he's now, he'd probably get mad at me for saying this, but I mean, he looks like he's 60, he travels and works and acts like he's 40, and he's 80 years old, and he's going strong. And he's, we were meeting to talk about how to care for marriages in our community. And you're just looking at his life. He didn't set out in his life and say, I want to be a famous author, and I want to have sell millions of books and prosper in all these ways. And everywhere I go, have people that recognize me. So he didn't set out to say that. He just said, God, I'm working with people in their marriages, and I want to understand how to help them more. And God gave him an idea about how people communicate love to one another differently, and how we have different languages, the way we express love. Some like physical touch, some like gifts, some like words of affirmation. And he, he wrote all this down because it was wisdom. Now, from that, many other good things and marks of that come in his life. But see, the wise man's not enamored by those other things because it was always about the wisdom in the first place. These other things are byproducts. And it would be so foolish to pursue the byproduct rather than the thing itself. It's like the famous fable about the goose that laid the golden eggs. You know, the farmer who had a goose He'd wake up and the goose would lay a, a golden egg. And he collected a few golden eggs. And finally, he got sort of greedy. And he said, I want to get all the gold quickly and get rich quickly. And so he killed the goose and opened up the goose to get all the gold out of the goose and found out there was no gold inside the goose. And, and the goose now was dead. And there was no more golden eggs to come. Because the thing that was valuable was the goose. Well, m more powerfully and Poignantly, of course, Jesus says this in the Sermon on the Mount. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. These things he's talking about, provision, clothing, food, they're not bad things, but the real pursuit of your life is the kingdom of God. You see, God's not a vending machine. I think some people, they, they get an idea that Christianity is this thing where you do your part and God does his part, but God doesn't relate to us quid pro quo. I do something for you, you do something for me, vice versa. He's not a vending machine. You put your coins in and then you get your candy bar out. If people put coins in and they don't get their candy bar out, they get mad. You ever seen videos of what people do to, to vending machines when they put their money in and don't get it? <laughs> it's pretty comical. They attack it. They karate chop it. They hit it. There was one person who attacked a vending machine and it fell over on them and killed them. God's not a vending machine. You're not putting in your quarters and doing your acts of obedience and paying your tithes and lifting up your, your righteousness and, and do enough of that and then you get back from God prosperity. Not at all. That's not, God's a person. He is the treasure. 
He is the wisdom. And you pursue him and, and get him, get Christ, get wisdom. And it may be that many of these good things follow, but if you pursue the fruit, you might get some of the fruit, but miss the treasure. Only a fool would spend his life pursuing the less valuable thing. What I'm saying is you could have joy and peace and life without financial success, but you could have financial success and have no joy and peace and life. Part of the key to Proverbs 13 is verse 16, because it says, of wisdom, this personified picture of wisdom, she has long life in her right hand and riches in the left. And the reason this is important is because the right hand is the strong hand. The right hand is the greater blessing. The right hand is always the one to notice. And she has in her right hand life, and in her left hand riches and honor. And, and, and this is a picture of of, of life with God. He has wisdom to give. And the wisdom is ultimately expressed in the person of Christ. And he wants you to fall in love with Christ. And to treasure the wisdom of Jesus above all else. And as you do, many other things will be prospered in your life. But if you get it backwards... It will be destructive to you, and you could miss it all. Jesus is the perfect expression of wisdom, for he is the one who exercised perfect wisdom, which means at every point, instead of pursuing the lesser treasures, riches, honor, popularity, fame, longevity, revenge, always being the one considered right, all of that. Instead, he pursued wisdom. He listened to his father. He never disobeyed his father. He had a listening heart, a heart of Shema. He had a discerning heart. And what it meant was when temptation came in the form of the devil offering him the kingdoms of this world, he resisted temptation because he had wisdom. So that wisdom set him on course Wisdom like that, it keeps you on course for a, a life that's disciplined. You can say no to things when you know what's most important. And it simplified his life. And he was unconcerned about all the things that he didn't do. And what this meant for Jesus was that though there was popularity in this world, there was throngs of crowds around him, that what he was looking for wasn't the popularity. And so he's able to face it when the time came when he was not popular and when they falsely accused him because his mission was the wisdom of God. And the wisdom of God was the cross, which was foolishness to people because there's nothing more foolish than thinking that a great leader would die upon a miserable cross of suffering and shame in the Roman Empire. But for God, it was the ultimate wisdom because what God wanted to do for you and me was impossible by any other means. He wanted to maintain his position of holiness and justice so that sin is punished. Because God must be just and therefore sin must be punished. But God wanted to be the justifier, the merciful one, the one who makes people just, who don't deserve to be just, and who aren't righteous in and of themselves. And in the cross, God's wrath and mercy met, and he became both just and justifier. And, and it, was the, it was the very picture and pinnacle of the wisdom of God, which seemed foolishness to the world. And it was the thing that Jesus pursued. And because he pursued it and he held on to it, he is the blessed one. And he was filled, therefore, in his exaltation with eternity and long life and riches and honor. And everyone who's in Christ, you are a partaker of a spiritual inheritance that Jesus has earned for you and bought through the wisdom of God in the cross of Jesus Christ. And so what that means for you, beloved, is that yes, when you get Christ, you become spiritually rich. When you get Christ, you get eternal life. When you get Christ, you're invited back to the tree of life. Wisdom, riches, honor, longevity, this is the treasure that matters 
these other treasures may follow. Keep the order right. So I got my shirt tucked in because I thought a little bit about what it would look like. (laughs) But I thought way more about how good and glorious is the grace of God, for that's what matters in the end. Get wisdom, and many other treasures may follow, and that's the gospel.